tell you a little bit about myself. And also, if you have any questions, since we're a small group, feel free to either shout out, hey, what's this mean, what, whatever, or if you, if you want, if you feel compelled to raise your hand, I'll also call on you. But just feel free to jump in at any time, I guess is what I'm saying. So my background, I am um, a school psychologist by training. Then I worked for Heartland Area Education Agency for five years before I went to the University of Iowa to get my PhD. But while I was in Heartland, I had a few little chairs as students who were really testing my skills in the area of behavior. That um, I so enjoyed them and still remember them fondly of being in a bathroom with this little girl throwing clean toilet water on me as a way to get me to go away. And things like that. And I thought, I'm just not doing these kids service enough, that I don't have all the skills that I want in order to help improve their behaviors. And so I decided to go get my PhD at the University of Iowa, that um, knowing within this area at that time with David Weber there and his behavioral clinics. Have, have any of you ever been to the Center for Disabilities and Development and seen Dave Weber or other professionals there? That Dave has um, the biobehavioral clinics. He's actually retiring this year. He'll, he'll be done in August, which is kind of sad. But I wanted to go work with him and really understand how you do thorough behavior assessment. And so that's why I went back to school. And then after graduating with my PhD, I had um, I spent a couple years doing an outpatient clinic and then decided I really wanted to get back in to help him with the school setting. And what came available is a contract with the Department of Education to be training people who are working in the schools how to do better behavior. So that's kind of where, where I've been the last few years, as well as Jamie, that our focus has been on training um, teams from the area education agencies, as well as from different school districts, how to do better for TAs. Um, more importantly, I'm the mother of two beloved dogs, and that they are my pride and joy. That Ben in the top picture is about 14 years old. He's a mixture between a child and a golden retriever that he has special needs that in the past um, five years ago, he lost one eye to glaucoma. And then four years ago, he lost the other eye. And so he's now blind. And it was just interesting to make accommodations in my house for him and um, try to work through that with him. And that, fortunately for dogs, their biggest sense that they focus on is their sense of smell. And so he still has a good, strong sense of smell. He still digs in the garbage. He, he smells something in there that he wants. And then Josie in the bottom level, her, her love is a ball that's right there. We were at the park, that she will do anything in order to catch a ball. She's probably about 12 years old. She looks certainly a lot older than that. He still looks like a puppy, but some dogs age better than others. Uh, and then I am an aunt, which I adore. Sadly, I have three nieces that live on the west coast in Oregon and two on the east coast in Virginia. So I don't get to see them very often. But this is the five of them at my parents' house, almost in order. That um, one of my nieces, Anna, has Down syndrome, and it's been she's out in Oregon, and it's been a really interesting process for me to work with my brother and sister-in-law to understand more of the parent perspective when having a child with a disability versus the professional perspective. Um, being with my focus on behavior, Anna Beth is really well behaved that she, she has the stubbornness that a lot of kids with Down syndrome have. But um, my brother became a stay-at-home dad when she was born. And so when she started preschool at the age of three, she had a really hard time with separation. And I'm a behavioral person, and I'm like, OK, we need to put a plan in place to help to fade, fade so that my brother doesn't need to stay there. Instead, he went to preschool for a year and a half. <laughs> and for like the first year, he pretty much, he, he, he was with her at the table and then gradually they faded into the corner of the room, but he sat back there and read. And for him, that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to have her upset. In my mind, I'm thinking, no, you have to let her, you have to break that. But obviously, she's done that, she's going to school by herself and things are fine. So certainly what they did was certainly appropriate and important for them. Um, and I think it's always an important question. For me as a professional to keep in mind that what my goals and the way that I think things should be done by the way that I train isn't the only path and that there are certain lots of other ways and it's meeting the family and following them with where, um, how they want to proceed and what they're ready to do. So it's been a great learning experience as well as um, she certainly brings a lot of love. Um, 
So the objectives that I wanted to cover today in the talk are really to identify what a functional behavioral assessment is, <coughs> to understand, to help you understand how it's important um, to do one well in order to identify <coughs> what should go into the behavior intervention plan, and then how to read the FBAs as part of the IEP paperwork. That um, we certainly don't make it user friendly for parents, and that. Luckily, there will be some revisions to the paperwork, both the IEP as well as the FBAs and the that will be coming out. Next year, they're going to start to pilot it, and hopefully that will help with the process. But still, I'm sure it's still going to end up with like 20 page IEPs like we do now, unfortunately. Um, but then also, more importantly, to give you some ideas for how to identify the differences between a high quality FBA and a lesser quality FBA, because I think it's important as as parents to know when when to say, I wonder if we need to bring in somebody else to look at this. So I'm going to give you some key things to look at, and if, if those pieces are missing, then um, you can ask, is there somebody else that can come in and I'm going to identify who those people might be. Um, and I didn't know whether or not, and I see you might know, because I know obviously they're videotaping and it'll be up on YouTube. I know in the past sometimes they put the presentations also online for people to see. The PowerPoints, and so, um, so in case you don't get everything written down that you want, there'll be another way to access um, the slides. So, what is a functional behavioral assessment? That sometimes I've heard people say, "I don't believe in behavior analysis." Well, and you kind of see this guy up here saying, "That's a similar to saying I don't believe in gravity." <laughs> that you may not like some of the things that behavior analysts say. I totally get that. But it's still the behavioral principles, there's still principles in the way um, how things operate. Just like gravity is here, no matter how much some, sometimes we don't want it to be. And if you have time to be floating. Um, so, what the literature tells us is that a functional behavior assessment is a set of assessment procedures that result in the identification and description of the relationships between unique characteristics of the individual and the contextual variables that trigger, motivate, and reinforce behavior. The FBA is used as the basis for designing individually tailored interventions. Simple enough, right? This is written by school psychologist? These are, um, <laughs> yep, Stavey is a school psychologist as well as Watson. And, and so they, no, I mean, and, and, oh, sorry, just overall, FBA. Um, they are written, so in, in this state, they can be written by a school psychologist, a special education consultant. Sometimes they're written by uh, um, the special education teacher. Okay. Um, a speech language pathologist can contribute to it. It's anybody that's really a part of that IEP team. But one of the okay. things, one of the things we're, still gonna, we're gonna talk about today is not everybody has the same skills that go into what that FBA may need. And so it's really about looking at how is that person trained to do behavioral assessment and whether or not, because um, not every school psychologist, for example, have the same skills related to behavioral assessment. Some have focused a lot more on academic assessment rather than behavioral assessment. Yes. I'm sorry. That's okay. Your question. <laughs> but basically, when we look to the literature, often we kind of feel like this, like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so what I want to do today is to really break down this definition, which the first part being, what does it mean to have a set of assessment procedures? Basically, I look at it as when we're doing a functional behavior assessment, we become detectives. And we're really looking at what's going on with the behavior and using some detective tools in order to figure out that it's all about trying to understand that student's behavior. The way we assess is we look at the records of the student. We go back and we ask questions like, so have th these behaviors been a concern every year of school? Is this something that's new? Um, what do the records tell us? We might look at the, if the student's been seen in outside clinic areas for evaluations to look at what that information brings um, for us to understand the student. We do interviews with um, teachers, parents, associates, who's ever involved with working with that student. 
And then often there are observations that are done in that classroom setting when the student's in a, in a classroom environment. You can, you can do a functional behavioral assessment of a two-year-old who spends all, the day, all day at home or at daycare as well and do them by looking at the behavior in those settings. And then when you're doing those observations, you're looking for some specific information that we'll get into a little bit later. And those are primarily, those three areas are primarily what you see in most of the FBAs that are done. Because often when you go through those three things, you're able to get answers to, to what's going on with the behavior. Sometimes, though, that's not enough. That after doing those, you put a plan in place, it's not as effective as what you would like. And so then there's, there's some other assessments that can be done that we kind of refer to as kind of some higher level assessments. And these, the format is looking at a student's choice and looking at trying to understand their behavior by the choices that they make. Um, looking at an antecedent analysis, so looking at when you when you put different instructional strategies or kind of what I call these front end strategies in place, how does the behavior of the student um, change related to those things, or a functional analysis where um, really we're doing an assessment and whenever the child has problem behavior, we're giving that child what we think they may be wanting. So if I take away your iPad and you hit me, I give it back to see whether or not that stops the behavior. I remind everybody, this is just assessment, and that's not going to be an intervention strategy. That it's, it, then I know that, gosh, they really like that iPad, and by taking it away, that triggers the behavior, and when it stops, it goes away. That tells me that one of the functions may be accessing a tangible. And so the reason I wanted to talk about these things is because these are words that you can look for sometimes in your FBA, especially if you're on a team where they're not having success in um, making your child, the student, successful, is that it can be time to ask, well, I wonder if we, we need some higher level assessments in order to help us out. And is that something the parent needs to specifically ask for, or is that something generally the people who are doing the assessment this is what so we need to do. it goes both ways. Okay. But then, I, then I think sometimes um, I believe everybody sitting around the table is, is wanting the best for that student. Sometimes we're not always thinking that there's other people um, that we can bring in to help. And so some, sometimes um, the, the teacher might be so bogged down with looking. Sometimes when, when you get going on one path, you, you forget to broaden the view. And so sometimes it might be the parent asking, I wonder if we need to bring in somebody else from the AEA to help us with that. That ideally I would love it to always be coming from the professionals saying, you know what, we have these other teams who can do more advanced assessment, let's bring them in. But I know that in reality that doesn't always happen. Yes? You can ask to have somebody from Heartland AEA come in and be a part of that. Is that separate than the school counselor that is part of AEA at your school? Yes, that, 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 um, because what happens is, so the AEAs um, kind of send out like a school psychologist to be at this school or a, a special education consultant to be at this school. AEAs also have specialty teams that, um, and one of the special teams, specialty teams is a challenging behavior team. And every AEA now has that challenging behavior team that you can always ask, do you think it's time that we try to access that team for further assessment? Does your kid have to be on a behavior plan in order to do that, to request so, that? And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this too, that it, for each AEA, primarily the student has, in order to access the behavior team, the student has to be in the eligibility process, and so parents would have had to sign consent looking at whether or not their student qualifies for special education and is in need of special education, or they already have to be staffed into special education. But it could be if your child has been in, edu in special education, like in reading, and started to have problems the fall, like they were staffed in reading in kindergarten, and then third grade start to have behavioral problems, then you could bring in that outside team in order to help to determine what type of behavior plan is necessary. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I might have missed so if they're already having a behavioral IEP mm -hmm. and it's clearly not working, yep. you can just 
like me as a parent, I can yep. say, hey, can you yep. bring this team in? Yes. Okay. Yep. And for somebody, I mean, I, I'm guessing pretty much everybody in here, probably their kid already is in special ed. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you assume they're in special ed and they're on an IEP, then they're going to be, they're going to meet that basic criteria. You would meet, I guess, no, it's no, but you're saying the criteria, criteria and you're saying bring the team in. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, you, you have to be in the process of getting a behavior plan in order to ask for a Heartland person or what? My daughter has had a behavior plan. Mm -hmm. They dropped it because she was doing so well. Mm -hmm. Now there's other outside things that are causing issues and they're holding off. They're not, they don't want to do a behavior. I, I don't know why they just, they don't want to do a behavior plan. I would kind of like something in place mm -hmm. so that when these things, when isolated incidents happen, mm -hmm. then I know what's going to happen. Right. And so, so, so then the, the first line of contact would be talk like as part of your IEP team, has it been a Heartland School psychologist or special ed consultant who's been working with your child? Yes. And so I would talk specifically with that person to see whether or not they can bring in the behavior team to help with a plan if that person doesn't feel like they can create a plan for your child. That you have that right to ask for that. And that person, like that school psychologist might say, you know what, I've been trained by the behavior team and I have this set of skills and I think that if we put this plan in place, it'll be okay. Or that person might, um, and I'll go through this more, and maybe it might be easier, because I have slides that address this specifically and it might make more sense when you also see kind of the framework but then, because the level of support that that behavior team might provide your team might change, or might, there's different levels of support. So a behavior team member might just consult with the school psychologist, and you might not see the behavior member at the meeting, or that behavior me member might come to a meeting, have a discussion, make recommendations, and then not necessarily see your child or that behavior member might come, do some assessment with your child, and then come to the team and talk about what those recommendations might be. There's a whole continuum of um, services and supports that they might provide to the team. Okay, I, I guess okay. that makes a lot of sense that you don't know behind the scenes who's talking to you anyway, doing yes. consulting. Yep. I just remember a couple years ago when things were really hard, kindergarten, first grade, and they said the general ed teacher, the special ed teacher, and the school psychologist all at different times observed her. They said they paid attention to her and they couldn't figure out what was triggering her reactions and her behaviors. Yep. And I'm like, let me come in. I can tell you, I can tell you it's probably sensory based. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that's what it was. And I'm like, these people that, that should be their specialty couldn't figure that out. <laughs> Why couldn't we have brought somebody from out, if I would have known about this at that time, if they can't figure out, can I say, can I have Heartland come in and observe? Can I have somebody else, if they are truly stumped and they don't know, and they refuse to let me come into the classroom, what else can we do? That's an issue where you could just have Heartland get involved with other specialties. Yes. Then it's, and you know, and I'm guessing they probably try to consult, do some consulting at that time, but they didn't have anybody else come in from outside to watch. And so, and, and these teams, um, they've just been, we've been working hard across, the Department of Ed has been working hard to grow these teams. And so, um, they've been growing in size and, size and having more opportunities to do, some, to do some of these other skills as part of the assessment. You had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. um, all of you as parents, it's your, it's your legal right to ask for evaluations in er any areas of need. So that includes mm -hmm. behavior. So if you see behavioral patterns in school, you have a right to do that. Request it in writing. It doesn't have to be per law, but it's just a better practice and say, I want an evaluation, but, um, a functional behavior assessment evaluation. And that would count as, the, as, as your request for an evaluation. And you can even put in your letter and this serves as my this letter serves as my consent to evaluate my child, mm -hmm. and they got 60 days by law to start doing the to finish the evaluation. It allows folks to start moving on that, and that's just one way to get it moving. Mm -hmm. If it has if it hasn't been moving already, is that, that 60 sense. school days or 60 calendar? Days? 60 you know? calendar days. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Yep. And, okay. 
So these are some of the different assessments that then become part of the behavioral assessment. Um, what I really want to focus in on is the other main parts of that definition, is the idea of looking at the individual, the contextual variables, and then also what reinforces behavior. These are called the ABCs, meaning that the contextual variables are antecedents. Those are things that happen before the behavior occurs. The individual is referring to the, be, the behavior of the child, as well as what also makes up that child as a whole. And then when we talk about reinforcement, we talk about the consequence, which a lot of people, when they hear the word consequence, they think of it being, I'm going to give you a consequence because you weren't paying attention. That's not a consequence. A consequence is just whatever happens immediately following the behavior. A consequence could be something as simple as that also that you, you raised your hand, you asked a nice question, and I said, thank you so much for contributing. That thank you, that praise statement, that attention is also a consequence. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about. Because the way a teacher gives directions is, is likely very different than the way the mom gives directions. <laughs> and so that certainly is, um, that's kind of why the focus is on interviewing the school team. Okay. But I think always parent input when sitting around the table is important. And if you talk about, I don't ever see those behaviors at home, hopefully they're following up with some questions about why you may not. And it could be that, um, just the differences in the demands, or it could also be you have a lot more preferred activities at home than what they do in school, and trying to get at some of those things that might be helpful. I was just thinking, because my input as far as like her, when she kind of explodes at school, mm -hmm. I have a lot more input on how to calm her down than what seems to be effective, because they like to just throw her in the isolation room, and up their effectiveness. So I guess that's why I was trying to find out why they didn't interview me, because I can give them ways to calm her down. Uh, but maybe that's not the place where that belongs anyways. Maybe it belongs somewhere else in the overall IEP. And, and where there is a section that it, that's related to where the consequences are. Okay. Um, that that's under the problem analysis part. That there's one section that says something that has the word antecedent. And then mm -hmm. there's usually some descriptions about what's happening before the behavior. Right. And then, then there's a peer comparison spot and then it goes to the consequence spot. And, and that's where they're analyzing what's happening after the, the problem behavior. Okay. Well, they skipped the peer, the peer when they went from incidents to consequences. Oh, never mind, it's down here. Okay, I see it, I get it, okay. And so, and again, sometimes, and this is what I, this is 
I think some, this is what becomes really hard when working with behaviors, is there's a lot of things we can do to calm, stupid, calm kids down when they're upset, but the question is whether or not at that time the adult should be working to calm them down. Like before when I gave the example of if I take your iPad away and you start to hit me, you start to become aggressive, I may know that I can give it back to him and he'll calm down, but from a behavioral standpoint, that's the wrong thing to do. Because then I'm teaching him, whenever he hits, he gets exactly what he wants. And so then that sometimes it's thinking, and that's a, that certainly is an extreme example of, of what happens. Like that seems more intuitive sense for people not to respond to a behavior that way. But I think about a student, it's, it's rethinking, it's rebooting. But I think about a student I worked with in the schools who one of his behaviors was, um, he was non-compliant, he wouldn't do work, he would growl, it would start to escalate if you persisted and he would then, he would go to yelling in the classroom, becoming disruptive, throwing things, and it would get to aggression, especially if you ever went to like, like not necessarily even touch him, but if you like cornered him, it's just that idea of I'm being cornered, I'm gonna go after. So what people, what a teacher would do is they'd stop by and say, oh, you know what, this, this like, would, would do in a very nice way trying to correct his work. He would growl at her, she would go away. And so again, because, and that going away calmed him down. He didn't growl anymore, he didn't escalate, he didn't do anything because they didn't want to, they didn't want to have a blow up. So again, that was a way they were trying to calm him down. But from a behavioral standpoint, then you're teaching the child when you growl, adults will go away. And that's an easy way to get out of doing what the adult is telling you to do. And so sometimes it's not necessarily about having a way to calm a kid down, but it's making sure that whatever they're want, wanting or whatever they're given is given to them once they calm down and they do something appropriate in order to get it. So if instead of growling, and I'm sorry, I keep saying it, just have to be in a special <laughs> Instead of growling, if he said, I need to be alone, then it would be great for the teacher to go away after using that phrase. Because now all of a sudden I'm teaching him, this is the way you communicate to get somebody to go away when you're not ready to have a discussion about something. So we're talking now about antecedents. And so I found these pictures. When I go into the classroom, often these are the different things that I'm seeing, or the things that I'm looking for when I go into a classroom. I'm looking for the group size that the, the student's receiving instruction. Is it a small group? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Or is it the large group? Because sometimes that can affect how a student's going to behave. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm looking for, if they're, if they're working on something, what's that difficulty level of the type of work that they're doing? What is, is it a preferred task? A kid who likes reading? Or is it, or is it math and something that the student really struggles in and absolutely hates? I'm looking at if the teacher is attending to the child, are they giving praise? Are they giving, making the student do, do corrections? Are they giving instruction? Um, I'm looking at the level of attention that might be going on with the teacher. Right here, the kids are all working by themselves at a table. Not a bad thing. And when I go in and I'm looking, I'm not making judgments on things, but it's just a matter of what is happening within that environment. If the, if the students are working alone like this in a small group, and that's where I'm seeing the problem behaviors the most often, that tells me something. I'm also looking at who has the teacher attention. Because sometimes, oh, I guess that's she's not here. Sometimes the, teacher, the two adults in the classroom might be talking to each other. The teacher and the associate or another teacher comes in, and students are fine when two adults are talking. But sometimes a student might get upset when a teacher is helping somebody else and not helping me. And so that's something that I'm looking at. Um, and then there's, out at the re recess time, I'm looking at, is the student being expected to take turns on an activity? Were they told they can no longer slide because they're, they're or swing because their two minutes of swing time is up and there's a line of five other kids who want to come and swing? And kind of understanding that dynamic. Are they playing with other kids? Are they playing by themselves? If they're playing with kids, are the kids playing something appropriate or fun? Is it there any miscues? Like I think of a game of tag, where sometimes I've seen a kid, some kids who appropriately touch and tag, and then I see kids who don't know what it means to tag somebody, and they like push them over. 
And then I start thinking, well, you know what, that's more of a skill issue than it is necessarily a behavior. And so those are just some of the questions in the way that I go into an environment and I look at what is happening with antecedents. And so those are some of the things that you should be seeing are referenced within your, your, the FDA. So when thinking about antecedents, often when I'm interviewing a teacher or an associate or sometimes a parent, they'll talk about the behavior just happens out of the blue. There's no reason whatsoever. I've tried, I've taken data, there's no, it happens at 8 o'clock, it happens at 10 o'clock, it happens at 11, there's no rhyme or reason to this behavior. There was nothing that happened that provokes it. In reality, now say it always with me, there's no such thing as no antecedent. There's always something that happened. The truth is, some antecedents are much easier to see than other antecedents. That kids don't just do stuff for no reason. Sometimes that reason is internal for students that have um, constipation issues. Sometimes they're incredibly backed up. And that's why their behavior is worse during these couple of days, because it's no fun to be all gassy and constipated and bloated. That's not something when I go in that I can see in the environment, that all of a sudden the kid isn't turning pink because they're constipated. <laughs> but it's something that would still be considered an antecedent or something that's contributing to their behavior. So that's the antecedent part. Any question about antecedents? When thinking about the individual, sometimes behavior analysts get kind of a bad rap because they're only focused on the environment and they forget about who that child is. We shouldn't be forgetting about who that child is. Because who they are tells us an awful lot about their behavior. I want to know whether or not how that child is developmentally. Are they on track academically? Do they have any language skills, skill deficits? Do they have a developmental um, diagnosis? Because knowing some of those things helps me to understand what else might be going on in the environment that's not making them successful. A student that has autism, for example, we know there are certain strategies that really help kids with autism to interpret their world, those being visual supports. If I know the student's diagnosed with autism and I go into a classroom and there's no visual structure or supports for them, I start to think maybe we should start there before focusing on the behavior that they're demonstrating and seeing whether or not they make a difference. I also think diagnoses of mental health. Often people think about behavior analysts um, either don't believe or, or, or they don't buy into some mental health diagnoses. That's not true. <laughs> that I certainly believe they're all out there. The thing is, just because a student's diagnosed with anxiety or depression doesn't mean I still can't look at their behavior functionally. And I think that's the important piece, is if a, kid, a student's diagnosed with depression, I'm going to make sure that they're getting help for their depression while I'm also looking at their environment in school to see what else we can do. Like I think about, when I think about a typical depressed kid, I think about somebody who's withdrawing and not engaged. So perhaps they need to go see an outside counselor and to get some, some therapy related to how to uh, think differently about what's going on in their world, and maybe even some medication. But in the school environment, I'm going to be looking at how can I give them incentives to start to engage with other kids, or how can I get them to want to do their work? And I'm gonna be putting those plans in place around that. I'm not necessarily fixing the depression because there's other people who are working more on that biological symptom. I'm just setting up an environment to where that student can still be successful while they're getting others to help. Or at least I'm gonna try my darndest. <laughs> so these are all important for understanding how that individual interacts with the environment. Talking about the individual, there's all sorts of challenging behaviors out there. They can be um, from the severity, can be certainly different, that it can be a kiddo who's just out of their seat a lot that we might need to do a functional behavioral assessment on. There could be a kiddo who is being disruptive, throwing things at other kids. Students who are hurting themselves by biting themselves, biting their nails, pulling their hair. Kids who are aggressive, biting somebody else swearing or making other verbal comments that aren't appropriate. I love this face. I think when I was little, I had that face a lot. <laughs> that I was a powder and somebody who would, who would put out that bottom lip as a way of trying to get what I want. And so the severity certainly is different. 
And so we understand the, the individual and what we're looking for, but then we're also going to look at what's happening afterwards because that gives us an idea of what's reinforcing that problem behavior. We're looking at the consequences. We wanted to know kind of what did the teacher do or respond to after that behavior occurred? What did other students do? Did they laugh? Did they move away? Did they help the student with their work in order for that student to be successful? The consequences always affect whether or not that behavior is going to occur again. And so if every time you raise your hand to participate, I'm giving you, I have, a, I have a basket of Snickers, and you really like Snickers. So if every time you're doing that, I'm giving you a Snickers, exactly, <laughs> the probability is going to increase. If every time um, you raise your hand, I ignore you and I call on somebody else, and you raised your hand five times really trying to get in there, and I'm never calling on you and I'm totally ignoring you, more than likely you're going to stop and say, I give up. We've all been in those situations that, um, where we try. Like, Nathan in the red shirt might have given up had I not been called on him and said, I noticed you had your hand right there. <laughs> when we think about functions of behavior, how the behavior is being reinforced, we look at whether or not it's a positive, positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. So it's either going to be gaining something or avoiding or escaping. So you can, you can gain access to an interaction, so attention from an adult or from a peer, or you can gain access to an item or activity. So whether it be food, whether it be toys, whether it be getting to go out for recess, whether it be watching a movie, reading a story, all of those activities. When you're escaping, you can also want to escape a social interaction, or you can want to escape an item activity or a task. Some of us like to escape calculus, for example. And so what this then helps us to understand is there are three main social functions. Those are gaining access to attention, gaining access to a tangible, and then also escaping or avoiding something. These are the three main reasons we have students who engage in problem behavior in, in the classroom or in the school setting as well as the home environment. So then when we think about what's happening with the student when asking the question did the student gain something, gain <coughs> the teacher redirects him because that's a form of attention. The teacher gives the student help. That's another form of attention. The principal shows up when all of a sudden I'm misbehaving in the classroom and the principal, not only does he show up, we get to go to his office and he helps me to calm down by, by giving me ice cream. Hopefully that <laughs> um, What else might the student gain? Peer might have laughed, a peer might have redirected or done something. The student might get an item back. If I'm swinging, and a kid comes over when my two minutes are up and I push the kid down, maybe that kid goes over and plays on the slide and I get to keep my swing. Or are there other things that a student gets? If when they misbehave, is that when fidgets come out? Is that when they get to go swing as, as kind of a sensory way of calming down? Um, are they gaining something whenever their behavior is escalated or they're getting into trouble? And then did the student avoid something? When they're taken to the office, they get to avoid the work that's there. When they're taken to a seclusionary room, a timeout room, they get to avoid everything that's going on in the classroom, whether it be the work, whether it be the peers, or whatever other demands. Um, do peers leave them alone? Do the teachers leave them alone? So the three main social functions are escape, tangible, and attention. There's also what we call a non-social function, and that's automatic. This um, happens often when, if a behavior is more of a habit, sometimes biting nails can be, um, can be automatic, that um, there's something internally that's happening, and I get something, I gain sometimes internally by biting my nails, or I get, um, I get to avoid something internally by biting my nails. Maybe I have a really bad headache, and when I bite my nails, I, I'm not as in tune with the headache. That automatic, um, there are fewer kids with an automatic function. It's still there. Um, we see it with self-injurious behaviors. Um, that's, it's always when something more internal is happening, something that we can't see. There's still ways that we assess it and we, we come to that conclusion.
but really all the social functions should be ruled out before a team starts to focus on the automatic function. Because it could be that a function is both automatic, so I bite my hand whenever I'm excited, whether it be positive, whether I'm happy, 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 or whether I'm really mad. So that might be just kind of automatic reinforcement for me, um, especially when I'm engaged in a really exciting activity. But I might also bite my hand whenever the teacher takes my iPad away. And so it could have both functions. And that's where life gets tricky with the FBA, because kids aren't usually just one thing. It's usually a combination of things, and it depends what's going on in the environment. That's why we have to be really good detectives. Do you have a question? autism world, so like the sensory issues and like the self-stim issues, things like that. It would be automatic. automatic. Yep. <coughs> yep. So Way back when I literally see that as yes. a secondary, you'd see if there was anything first. Yes. Then we do the yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because, and the reason that is, is because we have a lot better tools to address the social stuff and a lot more evidence-based interventions. And it's I always hate to use the word easy because nothing's easy, but it is a little, it's, it seems like we can have a lot more success when there's a social function faster than when there's an automatic function. And so even if part of the behavior is automatic, if we can decrease 50% that happens to be rate related to a tangible function, that's a way to make it to success. Because mm -hmm. as a parent, you know, you may be very into, and I think that was kind of what she was talking about, about the sensory issues. Mm -hmm. So how do you address those automatic things with that self stimming and that stuff? Some of it is is okay. It's not destructive. Exactly. But that picking, that picking mm -hmm. stuff, because that's my daughter. Is that one of the things you're going to get into later? I'm not in it because I could, to be honest with you, I could spend all morning talking about FBAs and all afternoons right. talking about intervention strategies and we would still only scrape the surface. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to get specifically into, uh -huh. how, to, into how to address it. Um, Do you the, have the, any the, the resources yes, yes, for people? The, 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 there's so yes. many people that have that yep. attacking the skin. Right. And, and what I would look at, especially with the self-skin behaviors, what, if other things have been ruled out, like picking, I would look at, I would Google habit reversal procedures and I would Google Raymond Milkenberger. And that there's a habit reversal clinic at the Center for Disabilities and Development. There is. There is. So there's, a, there's, a, ha, there's a habit reversal clinic at the Center for Disabilities and Development that Matthew O'Brien is the psychologist. Mm -hmm. That that started maybe, I think he started that last summer. It's on Fridays. And so then he would do an assessment and then looking at just making sure that it, it kind of qualifies as a habit and then he would help put a plan in place for decreasing that behavior. What, what habit reversal tells us often is what's important is finding something else for the student to do or that person to do rather than engaging the behavior, something to replace that behavior. Okay, so you had said I would Google habit reversal process? Or, 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 yep, that, or, or just what? habit reversal and, and then um, a procedure. And, but there was a second thing you said? Oh, the, uh, one, one of the, the people who's big in the habit reversal world, his name is Ray uh, Miltenberger. It's M-I-L-T-E-N, and then I think it's B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E okay. Another person who's also big that he have trained under Ray is Doug Woods. That's an easier one to spell. <laughs> like her psychiatrist has said, really, um, if she doesn't want to stop any of that picking behavior, it's really hard to address it. And it's, it's just so hard to, to find a med or something that you can do yep. for that. And that's where habit reversal procedures can help. I'm not saying it, it'll fix everything, right? but it can be very successful. And, and it does when one of the things as part of the procedures is building an awareness for the person. And so I think that's where your psychiatrist is talking about if there's that desire. Yep. But then there are still other things people in their environment can do to set up um, so that then the person, the, your, your child is less likely to engage in that thinking. We did it with my kids on the spectrum also. And mm -hmm. not through that clinic, but it was that type of behavior. And what we did was we wrote him into the schedule. He had to do the behavior for 10 minutes at a time. And then... Oh, she would love it. And, and then 
-hmm. But what we taught him was, was there were appropriate times to do it. It was a self-awareness step. There were appropriate times to do it and not appropriate times to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where they came from. So it was like, this is when you can do the behavior and it's appropriate, and this is when you can't do the behavior. It's not appropriate. Okay. okay. Yes. So how, do you, how does that go towards people who aren't as aware, people who are severe profound? That's where the adults in the world are going to be really important and to be able to help find what often we end up looking at within our assessment is when they have, we kind of look at what's going on in their environment and we talked about an enriched environment versus a less enriched environment. And if we can create an enriched environment where they're not going to engage in the behavior, then it's spending more time in that enriched environment as a way of decreasing it. And so it's really setting up their world so that they have more stuff. Because sometimes I think, not for everybody, I kind of like to think about it, is it occurs when somebody's bored and has nothing else to do. And so if that's the case, how can we give them things to do and be switching things up on them so that they're not getting bored? I, I just have a headbanger who had things when he's bad, he had things when he's mm -hmm. not paying attention to him. Look at him out of his wheelchair and look at you and then slam his head down. Yep. Could you look at you? Wait for you to give a reaction. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think it's important where that FBA is going to be really important because you're going to want to know exactly what the functions of those behaviors are. And then you're going to want to see a speech language pathologist and you're going to want to find out or, or a behavior analyst and figure out what is that phrase and what tools can we use to get him to communicate. Because whether or not instead of banging his head, does he need a micro switch to say, I want something new. And to see then what, what you can do to teach them to communicate. Because I can do the cool slide and maybe it's coming up here. So within the, um, maybe I'll say that. So it is important to go through the FBI, the FBA, because I like to mess with kids. And I want to turn their world upside down. And that's what an FBA does. Because I, I now I understand what trips your trigger. So what do you do when the school says that they cannot figure out the antecedents for your kids' behavior? Then you say, then we need to get your challenging behavior team involved. Because if you can't do it, we need to find somebody who can. And what do you say when you have a lot of challenging behaviors at recess, unstructured time, when it's hard to keep up with the kids and hard to pay attention to everything going on? There are still ways to do it, and there's ways to assess it systematically and to say, I want the experts to come in. And, and to say, hey, you know, this team, we've been working really hard together, and I know that we're all wanting to make Johnny successful, but we're not getting to the place that we all want Johnny to be. We need to bring in somebody else to help us. So it's not as a way of... You're not doing your job, we're going to bring in somebody else. But it's like, we do need more advanced level people in order to do it. And we have those people now in the state that you can contact within the ADAs and within some of the school districts that can be helpful for that. Because just as Nathan said, so we, we do an FBA because it's the law that we have to do it. Um, because we don't want those behaviors to continue. Because then that student's not being successful in the school setting and likely won't be successful in the world setting. We do an FBA because, in my mind, I'm not going to listen to you unless we're talking <laughs> evidence-based practices. And the FBA leads us to those evidence-based practices that we know there's tons of literature on how successful an FBA can be in determining what intervention is in place. <coughs> we do an FBA because if the problem behavior gets at either gaining something or escaping something, we turn it around and so that doesn't work anymore. And now it's your appropriate behavior that's going to get you what you want. the link between the FBA and the BIP. So just to overview, the, the FBA defines what needs to happen in the environment and leads to the hypothesis of what that function is. The behavior plan then just defines what we need to do differently to create that environment for success. And also how we need to teach that student in order to be more successful. Because oftentimes in the behavioral plan we might be teaching how to request help. We might be teaching how to request to have a break time or how to request to get your iPad back. All of those things that might need to be taught. And what I love the most is this little guy saying, let me get it straight. I don't have to scream and yell to get my cookie. <laughs> that there's another way. This is what behavior teams should be able to help you define and to understand if the current IEP team isn't able to. Because then all of a sudden, we have her saying, I don't have to bite my hand to avoid the work. You mean there's another thing I can do? I don't have to throw my block to get my truck back. I don't have to bite my brother to get my mom's attention. 
<laughs> I don't have to swear to get my peers attention. I don't have to pull my hair to be pushed on the swing. I don't have to protest to get help. <coughs> we don't, we'll, we'll make their lives so much better when we figure out why their behavior is occurring and how we can teach them differently. What I have, and I love this because I feel so, I hate the way our system is set up. And it's all, like I love what it requires, but I hate how it's documented and how it's shared. I think this is so true of how parents feel when, when they look at the FDA, the BIF, the IEP, it's like the, the re and what? The contingency who? They can't keep up with everything. How teachers feel? I finally caught up on my massive amounts of paperwork, said no teacher ever. Insert speech language pathologist, insert school psychologist, insert school social worker. It's, what the, it's the system that we have. It's important to have that documentation. But it's also important that we recognize kind of both sides of the puzzle and to be working together in order to find those solutions. So I've kind of talked about before um, what is in an FBA. At minimum, you should always have a good behavioral definition or definition of, of the behaviors. You should have some direct observation data where somebody has looked and observe what's happening in the classroom or in the recess, wherever the problems are occurring. Then there's that problem analysis piece where you're really analyzing the data that's been collected. They should identify what are some things on the front end that can be changed, and they should have a hypothesis about the function. And that hypothesis can only be attention, tangible, escape, or automatic when they come to that conclusion. A function is never because this is what Johnny does, because Johnny has autism, because Johnny has ADHD. ADHD and autism might be a contributing factor, but it's not the function of their behavior. And hopefully, and it's also never because they want to control their world. Those are things we've been working hard with, with everybody doing FBAs around the state not to see those functions of behavior. Because when we talk about this is just what Johnny does, we're saying, there's nothing we can do about it, it's just an eight to him. And that's not true. When I see it's about control, then I think everybody thinks that Susie's manipulating her world. And they're not looking at truly what's going on in the environment that's creating her to behave that way, or that's adding to her to behave that way. Thinking of a behavioral definition. <laughs> Dear Santa, define good. Johnny gets a sticker whenever he has a good day. I bet what a good day means to you is different than what it means to you and is different than what it means to you. How is Johnny supposed to know? What I did, and this will be helpful because I knew this isn't necessarily readable, but I knew that these slides would be up and they'll give you examples so you can then go back and look at it at some point. But I gave examples directly from FBAs that are high quality behavioral definitions. What they include is, so disruptive behavior. It's behaviors that interrupt or disturb an activity. What's an example of that? It is touching others, making faces, talking to, each, to others, or engaging in loud noises. Well, what doesn't it look like? Non-examples. It's touching or talking to somebody at recess. It's, it's um, at, at recess, lunch, or transition time, making noises that don't disturb the work of others. Those are what we're not calling disruptive. Or aggression, that is behaviors that may harm another individual through physical contact, such as hitting, kicking, biting, or scratching. But it's not slamming books or an object down, swearing, and then calling or throwing things. Those might be other problem behaviors, but those aren't the aggression that we're concerned about. There's some other, um, just with verbal aggression and another one of physical aggression. These are what I call high quality definitions. They are specific. When I tell you that aggression means hitting with an open hand, um, head butting with the front of your head and into somebody else's body, you know what that looks like when you go into a classroom. If I say, I'm not sure, I think that's the next slide. Lesser quality things are Todd hurts others. Joe's Jose is disrespectful. David is angry, Monica is defiant. Those behaviors, we all have different ideas of what defiant looks like, what disrespectful looks like. We need to specify what does anger look like for David. 
anger is, David turns red, lifts up his arms with fists, and is going and is screaming and moving his fists back and forth. The descriptive summary. That's the next part of the FBA. And this is where um, teams document primarily um, the interviews that they've done, um, they, they talk about the observations that they've also done, and other assessments. So observations should talk about which settings that the observations were done in. If there's problems at recess, it's not helpful to only observe in the classroom. If there's problems in the hallway, it's not helpful to only observe at recess. Because you want to understand how the behavior is in each of those individual contexts where there's problems. In the hallway, I might engage in aggression for a different reason than I do in the classroom. And it's important to be looking at that. And I think this is, this is also a really important point. The extent of your data collection should reflect the complexity of your behavior. <coughs> the more behaviors of concerns there are, the more assessments that should be in the FBA. The more severe the behavior is. When you talk about a headbanger, somebody who might be giving them up some, themselves a concussion every time they hit their head, or might be really damaging their brain, I'm going to want to go to a higher intense, have a lot more assessment on that student than a student whose problem behavior is getting up out of their seat all the The interviews, they should talk about what happens before the problem behavior and what happens after the behavior. An interview that talks about um, the, just the history of the student isn't helpful. Or that then talks about how only the academic level isn't as helpful. That we want to be talking about what's happening before and after the behaviors. Within the problem analysis, we want to be looking at um, what's the concern about the behavior. Is it the frequency? So is it the average number of aggression, um, aggressive behaviors <coughs> per day that's the problem behavior? We should be, when, when asked about what's concerning about the behavior, you should start to see numbers. If you're not seeing numbers, that's something to bring up to the team. Because if they're just saying um, they're aggressive, you want to know, well, how often are they aggressive? You want to know whether or not, if they have data to show that it's increasing. You want to know how long the, the, the time span was that they took the data. Maybe he had one bad day and he had five aggressive episodes, but he hasn't aggressed for the past month. If they only put he does five aggressive episodes a day, they're missing the boat on truly what the whole picture is. Duration is another way of getting at numbers looking at the time that the behavior lasts. So this is a nice example. Disruptive behaviors vary in time between 3 minutes and 30 minutes, with the average time being 20 minute, minutes when reviewing two, 10 days of data. You have a clear picture of how I was behaving in the classroom. Intensity, again, seeing more numbers are an explanation of why they're in intense. Self-injurious behaviors have resulted in broken skin and bleeding on 2 out of 20 episodes. Bruising has occurred on 10 out of 20. This is, this is concerning, and this would be the type of behavior I would want a more thorough assessment done. I would want more than just two observations in the classroom done in order to understand it. Then looking at the antecedents. This is again when they talk about um, the next part of that the, the FBA, the problem analysis, is looking at the environmental conditions of the antecedents and the consequences. Again, you're going to start to see numbers in here if a good observation was done. You're going to be seeing, so here they're talking about, um, they are collected by the keeping the classroom setting a transition from a non-structured activity to a structured activity, or transition between two structured activities preceded and before the problem behavior around 59% of the occasions. Adult attention was provided to other students as an antecedent on 24% of the time occasions that there was problem behavior. You have a better idea and understanding of how often is removing adult attention the trigger for the problem behavior. That kind of starts to guide to what that function is. 
consequences, you're going to see a, you, you should be seeing a similar thing. You should be seeing something to where it talks about, um, so consequences in the form of a variety of types of tensions, including redirection, offering motivation or encouragement, providing help and reminding her of your choices are provided 60% of the time following refusal behavior. So they saw a lot of attention given following their refusal behavior. What's also important is looking at um, what stops the behavior. And I think there's a line in here. Attention in the form of providing help and reminding of choices were effective 50% of the time that they followed the problem behavior. Meaning whenever the teacher provided attention, the behavior stopped half of the time. That starts us to think, well, maybe this is a, an attention-seeking behavior because attention is working to turn off that behavior. Just like when I give you the iPad back, it turns off the, the hitting that you might be doing towards me. So in a lesser quality FBA, you're going to see statements like the behavior occurs when demands are presented, and that's the antecedent. Or you might see the response of the teacher is providing attention. There's, there's likely little data or little numbers in the description. So there are, um, it might be, there's just the behaviors concerning, um, are the behaviors of concern and the antecedents and consequences. There's just no numbers that you're looking at. There's also, in the past, and I hope this isn't happening much anymore, there isn't a tie between what people are observing and what the problem behavior is. So if you're really concerned about aggression or skin picking, and the observation talks about how on task the child is, that's a total mismatch. That tells you that they weren't observing for problem behavior. It could be that when they observed, there were no problem behaviors. That happens, that if they're looking at skin picking, they come at a time where it's a really engaged activity, they might not see any. So what a higher quality FDA would then go in to say, a person would go in to say, I need to observe much more times, or I need to set up a better tool for the teacher to collect that data for me at, so I know when to come back and observe. Because you really can't do an FBA of a behavior that you've never seen or observed. Yeah. And then there's a mismatch between the behaviors discussed yeah, and the behavior of concern. Then we get to the hypothesis function. Like I said before, there's, a better, um, there's only the four functions you can refer to. And that really, a stronger hypothesis statement also provides the context in which the behavior is occurring. So during instructional times, when the teacher or peer attention is diverted, John demonstrates disruptive behavior in order to gain attention, or gain adult and a peer attention. That tells you when the behavior is happening and why the student is doing it. So how do we request additional assistance? One thing I think you need to think about is when to request more. So if you have a plan in place and your behavior is improving, even if you have a lesser quality FBA, you still might be okay because things are going well. As long as you trust the data that things are going well. But if you're concerned about improvement after implementing the plan, you can always ask about what time should we expect to see an increase in the behavior? Behavior plans don't work necessarily immediately, but you should if after, if you have a new plan in place after a week or two, you should be able to see a trend in the data to see are they decreasing, are they increasing, are they staying the same. If they're either increasing or staying the same, you should be having a discussion about what else should we be doing. Because within a two week period, you should be seeing a difference. Um, is suspension being used with the new behavior plan? If your child's not in the school setting, you're not going to be able to learn. And if with a new behavior plan you have in place, they're still having to suspend, I would want to, to, to bring up the discussion of maybe we need more assessment. And that maybe we're not on the right track. If episodes of restraint and timeout are not decreasing in the new behavioral plan, we need to relook at the assessment that we've done and to see if there's something else that, that we can do to. There certainly are, unfortunately, there are times where these things need to be used. But these shouldn't be the main components of your behavior plan. And so if they're being used a lot, that tells you something else needs to change. Other times when to request more, when you're looking at the FBA and you're seeing it's lacking 
antecedents, it's lacking consequences, and that, that, that hypothesized behavior functions on the attention, tangible or escape, um, or automatic. Again, like I said before, if the only thing is an automatic reinforcement, I think it's also worth having somebody else come in and just double check that they come to the same conclusion. When to reflect more. So if they hypothesize escape is a fun, was that a thing for time? No. Okay. When they have, if they hypothesize that um, the function of the behavior is escape and they're primarily using timeout, that's another time in order to request more help. Because if you think about it, like I said earlier, if the, whenever I'm disruptive, the principal comes and takes me to another seclusionary room, if I don't want to do my work, I no longer have to do it. And that's kind of cool. And so there's a mismatch between what the function is and what the behavior is. Not that there aren't times when you still use timeout with an escape behavior, but it's just important that everybody's understanding how it's becoming more complex, and that then you ask the question, you know, these are counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense when we're saying that my child wants to escape demands, but every time he hits you during demand, he goes to timeout. That doesn't make sense to me. Explain it to me why you think that's a good strategy for my child. And after my child doesn't want to be in there, takes him about four hours to calm her down, she flips out. So, <coughs> I think yes. we need to run away. Yep. Yep, I think so because that's a long, that's a lot of instruction to be missing, and I and I think, is there enough reinforcement going on in the classroom? What level? Because I also tell people if they're using timeout, you have to have you you need to really be looking at how much reinforcement, or in another word, how many rewards, how much motivation is in place for my child to be staying and doing that work. That should be really really high. If, if the consequence for his problem behavior is being removed and, in this, and being put in another classroom. I want to see that student getting, whether if they're after attention, if they're after tangible, getting a lot of breaks to those really frequency, really frequently so that they want to stay in there. So who do you contact? Some people believe that you have to go to a BCBA. Well, in Iowa, I think there's only like 42. A BCBA, I'm sorry, is a board certified behavior analyst. Those are, are people that everybody assumes has the skills in order to do this really well. It certainly is the specialty of their training, but in Iowa, or all over, you have to remember the credential doesn't always guarantee better services. And that's where the, um, the challenging behavior teams of the ADAs come in and all the training that the Department of Ed has been doing with those ADA teams. So, um, as I talked about earlier, you can talk to your ADA team about having a referral to the challenging behavior team. That in Iowa, we have trained 26 people to be what we call to the advanced level at the AEA level on the behavior teams who can do the whole spectrum of assessments that I showed you earlier. 26 isn't a lot, I understand that, but it's certain these people are starting to train additional members of their team, and so we're starting to kind of see this compounding of that. Additionally, is there somewhere that lists who those 26 people are? They would be the one that So it's, it's always the, everybody calls themselves a challenging behavior team within the AEA. Okay. And so some of them are a challenging behavior autism team, and some are just the challenging behavior team. And so if you go, or if you want to talk to me afterwards, okay. and we find out about the AEA, I can give you okay. names too. We're training school districts. We have 43 people that we're training within school districts. Those school districts are Cedar Rapids. Council Bluffs, Des Moines, Butte, Fort Dodge, Iowa City, Mason City, Marshalltown, and Waterloo. If you think that your school district should have its own behavior team, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. To get a school district behavior team involved, the majority of them, you have to go to the principal. And that's how the principal then invites them to come in and help. <coughs> behavior team members can use higher level assessments. And then I love this. So what, what are you going to get? Well, perhaps his behavior hasn't changed because your behavior hasn't changed. That's not going to You can expect that part of the recommendations is going to be changing the adult behaviors, um, as well as then hopefully finding some other strategies in order um, to be helpful. 